Welcome to Access Community Television. I'm Molly Caron. Where investment reigns supreme, we at Access Community TV continue to emphasize the importance of community. We're going to push a little decolonization and seduce you with social change. And we're obviously going to honor our elders. We begin with a report from the Chinatown Action Group. We have Wilson Leung returning and Victoria Chen, first time here on Access TV. They're going to bring us up to date on the month of activities in the Chinatown Youth Coalition. Welcome to Access Community Television. I'm Victoria Chen, here with Wilson Liang from the Chinatown Action Group. Thanks for joining us today, Wilson. Full disclosure, I'm also from Chinatown Action Group. Um, and we're here today to discuss some of the things that have been happening in Chinatown um, with the Chinatown Youth Coalition. Wilson, can you tell us a little bit about the Youth Coalition and who's in it? Uh, yes, um, welcome to um, uh, XXTV. Uh, Chinatown Youth Co Cooperative is, is an inter intergenerational group, uh, including like a senior youth, uh, including the group of Youth Collective for Chinatown and uh, Youth for Chinatown Seniors, and uh, Chinatown Action Group, Chinatown Concern Group, and Hua Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot going on with. Uh, the Chinatown Youth Coalition. Can you tell us about some of what's happening, especially around 105 Keeper? Uh, yes, as, um, as everybody knows, and uh, recently, uh, Chinatown is a very hot spot for development. And uh, the community all, 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 all said like uh, it, it just goes too fast. And 105 Keeper, it's a, it, it's a very controversial development proposal. Um, it's located at the heart of Chinatown and surrounded by cultural sensitive, like a place like uh, uh, the Shenzhen Garden, the mm -hmm. Chinese Cultural Center, and the um, and this, uh, another like uh, two another couple like a uh, heritage building just an alleyway away at the back of the of the site, and uh, and the proposal is. Uh, asking to build like a, a tall building, which is not fitting in the cultural content and the heritage content in this particular location. And uh, as, as, as most of people know, this uh, controversial proposal has been going on for a while and have been turned down and now the developer want to come back again and try to, try to uh, move on to build this high rise. Um, and the community, and this uh, uh, Chinatown Youth Coalition, they, they, they had already made it very clear, this particular site is suitable for 100% senior housing and also cultural appropriate public space for, for example, like a senior for, for low income people and access. Um, and, and right now, um, the uh, new proposal, it, uh, according to like a lot of people's opinion of, for example, um, a professor from UBC, so the new proposal is is not much different mm. before he was turned down. So it's kind of a minor adjustment, and and want to come back again. Right. Yeah, that's actually really relevant to some of what Chinatown Action Group is doing with uh, Tea Time. So on April 30th, we had Tea Time with seniors, um, as you know, and um, we talked to seniors uh, about some of their concerns and their, the changes that are happening in Chinatown and how that impacts them. Um, so gen like uh, the developments and having more seniors housing and culturally appropriate spaces, as you mentioned, yeah, those are all things that came up um, that the seniors talked about. And so Chinatown Action Group is hoping to do more um, tea times, a uh, series of them, to explore some of these issues that people in the community care about and, gotcha. and explore a little bit more. So those are really exciting things um, going on. Uh, 
And I'm sure there's a lot more. I think especially with seniors, um, there's a mm -hmm. lot of seniors attending the hot and noisy uh, Mahjong, Mahjong plays on mm -hmm. the last Saturday of each month. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Wilson? Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, community member, they need to be uh, connected. They need, mm -hmm. need to be like us. Uh, like uh, know each other and socializing that is part of the life it is just, this is one of the way to keep people in a healthy lifestyle um, and the tri uh, the uh, youth collaborative for the Chinatown they um, they have a summer series of this mahjong is coming back this summer so that was the first one and um, and just as uh, as usual, it attracts lots of people, including the uh, young generation, including like uh, in mid age, and including the seniors. They come together and play mahjong and 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 meet each other, make new friends, and mm -hmm. it's a, it's it's a, it's a great time for people to um, to take to take back the public space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very exciting. I think I really like the idea of like bringing back um, community spaces together, and that's a little bit of similar to what we, uh, Chinatown Action Group was trying to do on May third, um, recently with our study on serve the people and revolutionary Asian American, um, Asian Pacific American movements and revolutionary um, organizations in uh, the states, and how we can learn from the history of movements and organizing there. So there's a lot of different intergenerational folks from different backgrounds coming together and creating spaces in our community to learn and talk about what we care about. Um, it sounds like there's there's lots going on. Even today, there's also uh, on May 8th, there's a Jane Swalk happening in Chinatown. So lots of new folks are learning more about Chinatown and getting to use this space. It's very exciting. Um, I think that's all of the time we have today. So unfortunately, we can't get into too much more detail about anything else. Um, Wilson, is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, if you want to uh, connect with us and if you want to support us, um, please uh, uh, please uh, contact us at uh, Chinatown Action Group at gmail.com or uh, Chinatown Action Group at Facebook. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so thank you for joining us today here on Access Community Television. Again, I'm Victoria and this is Wilson from Chinatown Action Group. Um, that's all we have for today and thanks for, thanks for joining us. Next is a first in our series of shorts, edited from a walking tour of the downtown east side, organized by the Museum of Vancouver. Let us begin at Insight. Because this is the 100 block, this is, this is ground zero of the open drug market in the city of Vancouver. And we thought, we lost that battle, but I now look at it as an opportunity. The, right across the street is the uh, Insight, and I manage all the peers that work in the, in the chill. And what I'm having them do is, they come across the street in the morning at 9 a.m. when they first open. We sweep from that end to the end here for any kind of drug paraphernalia, and then we're going to leave a little card saying you've been serviced by the Insight community team. Thank you. So, this is the injection site. It is. Um the only, well not now that Dr. Peters has legally been That's exempt, it's the only public legal supervised injection site in the entire continent of North America. And what's insane about that is that is seriously the only place you can walk into as a drug user and not be a criminal. Um, so the fight to open that though, I would just say in spite of, <coughs> and Dean will certainly share Van Du's role, what they did, but what I will like to say is that the fight to open that, in my opinion, began when we opened the Portland because it was about the same fight, about just legitimating space for people who use drugs. And it was very uh, um, contentious and people had this idea that by allowing people who use drugs to have space that you were somehow celebrating drug use as opposed to celebrating the lives of people who use drugs. And there's a very big distinction in my mind. In 1996, Bud Osborne came to me in the old Portland and said, we have to do something, this is ridiculous, too many people are dying. Bud was a, a poet, activist, drug user. He was the founder of Van Du. We stretched a 50-foot banner across Maine and Hastings. We dragged out a bunch of drug users with us. Van Du didn't really even exist at that point. And 
we built a bunch of crosses and we stuck them all up in Oppenheimer Park and we called it the Killing Fields Protest and the Thousand Crosses. And in history, this is like an event that people now talk about as the beginning of the movement to open the injection site. We had a press conference. It was the first time there was national media about it. Then that next, the next thing that happened was in the downtown east side community, there wasn't anything but consensus around supervised injection. Drug users themselves would say to you, oh no, that would be terrible. That would be like giving candy to a baby if you let me use drugs. I have to go to treatment. So we got a grant from Health Canada and we put up a tent in Oppenheimer Park and held an event called Out of Harm's Way where we brought in the chief of police from Frankfurt, Germany. We brought in experts from Europe and, um, and the US and Canada. Bruce Alexander, who's a professor at Simon Fraser, spoke from Canada. And they all presented different models of dealing with drug users in under the rubric of what do we do about inner city drugs and crime. And 800 people from the neighborhood showed up. It was a free event. And literally the next day, the conversation in the community changed. For the first three years we were open, the only thing open in that building was the injection site. And we had always wanted the detoxification center up top and the transitional housing above that so that people could be safe. But they wouldn't fund it. These politicians said, we demand treatment. Well, we want detoxes and treatment. Can we fund? They wouldn't fund it. They wanted to leave it as a standalone so that they could whip us with their political brush that it would demonize drug users. Now that building has, a, say, the detox on the second floor, the transitional housing. We have, you know, primary health care on the, on the bottom floor. It is so much more than a supervised injection site. And I really get angry when people are, oh, it's, a, it's the injection site. No, that's gold, gold standard medicine that's going on there. And it's a complete way of dealing with the attic. It's not just, the injection part is so small. It just irks me. This is, this is a, a, set, a, a medical center for addicts, and that's what it does. That's what it is. We're going to freshen things up here on Access TV. Carvin is a community organizer and activist. He's been paying close attention to the public consultation process at the Vancouver School Board. He was preparing for a presentation to the VSB when he met some fresh voices. Diego Cardona is here to speak with Carvin, and they're particularly concerned about the budget and the money allotted to immigrant and refugee kids who come to a public system that is underfunded, and they will obviously have a higher likelihood of dropout if this sort of funding continues. Hi, my name is Carvin. I'm on Access TV. Today here with me is Diego Cardona from Fresh Voices. Um, I got connected with Fresh Voices because um, I was really looking for uh, some research for the speech I was making at Vancouver School Board. Uh, last month they had a proposed budget that had many cuts that would negatively impact immigrant and refugee communities. And um, just as an update, on May 6th, um, the chairperson uh, wrote to community groups saying that uh, the superintendent will carry with the cuts of the preliminary budget and um, the board will continue to try to fight for funding from the provincial government. So thank you so much for being here with me, Diego. Uh, I want to know, how did you first get involved with Fresh Voices? So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So Fresh Voices is an initiative that engages racialized immigrant and refugee youth on issues of policy making. And it's sort of a, it, it, it brings together young people from different parts of the Lower Mainland who have been able to articulate their experiences and translate that into policy recommendations. And um, I was wondering, uh, what are some recent initiatives that uh, Fresh Voices is doing? So for, uh, the most recent initiatives that we've done is that uh, we always, every year, we hold forums where we bring uh, 150 immigrant refugee youth together with policymakers from all levels of government. So our most recent forum was in November of last year, and we've been working on how do we gather everything that came out of that forum and, and put a new report together that addresses some of the current issues that immigrant refugee youth are facing, particularly in the school system, which are not very different from the issues that we were facing four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. But some data needs to be updated. 
So myself being a first generation immigrant myself, um, and also my grandma um, was a war refugee uh, who was fleeing from uh, the wet and tropical um, river delta of Hong Kong. And uh, it was the Japanese occupation. And so after the war occupation, uh, she had a hard time integrating back into the school system, I think due to poor planning and also um, just lack of funding. So um, what is it like, uh, would you say? What's like a common experience for a lot of people who are uh, refugees or immigrants coming into a school system that is experiencing budget cuts? Yeah, so I think the budget cuts uh, really are seen, particularly within uh, refugee communities, uh, particularly amongst Latinos and other uh, ca categories of refugees. We have very high dropout rates from high school that range anywhere between 40% and 60%. Mm -hmm. And that's in particularly due to the fact that the lack of resources and, and proper uh, resources for teachers and staff to deal with the trauma that comes with being a refugee is not there. So particularly students are getting into a school system that doesn't have the resources to understand their full journey. Mm. So they are often being understood by narrow stereotypes that, that really uh, minimize their ability to thrive within the school system. Because now people are saying, well, this person might be from this background, so we associate these things with, from where they're from, mm -hmm. so maybe they're not gonna succeed. So what we're trying to do from Fresh Voices is how do we do allocate the proper resources so teachers and staff can be trained to fully understand the journeys of refugees and migrants. And to, but also, what most important is that we understand that immigrant refugee youth are not just defined by their refugee or migrant journey, mm -hmm. but they must be allowed to reach their full potential in the school system. But in order to do that, we must first understand what it means truly to become to be a, a refugee or an immigrant in the school system. Awesome, all right, we gotta wrap up. How do we get connected with Fresh Voices? So we love when people visit our website, freshvoices.ca, and you can follow us on Twitter at Fresh Voices. And we're always out there, you know, trying to advocate for these issues. And we also always welcome feedback. So awesome. thank yeah. you. Thank you for the opportunity for, to be here. The Heartwood Community Cafe has partnered with local music therapists for a night of singing and soup. Perfect. This is a fundraiser for their Soup for the People program. Daniel Carr reports. Celebration. It's actually organized by Shannon Ingersoll, who runs um, our open mics that happen every first Friday. So when she she herself is a music therapist, so when the month came, she said, oh, I want to come celebrate, bring a group of people to be able to perform, and also fundraise for Hartman, um, for Super the People. community builder so I just love being able to gather with other music therapists. The music therapy community is small to begin with and we all, a lot of us know each other and then having uh, you know five of us sing in a community social justice space just feels like the epitome of community building to me so it's pretty fun. We're all music therapists performing tonight and the money goes towards Heartwood Cafes, I believe their community soup kitchen program so sort of just giving back and raising awareness for music therapy. Um, it's our Pay What You Can uh, soup program, which is offered every day, Tuesday through Sunday. Um, and we provide hot, nourishing, nutritious, amazing soup that's made with as many organic and local ingredients as possible. Anyone can come in and get a bowl of soup in our Music can take you very deeply, very quickly, and there can be responsive reactions that may be unhealthy or may be traumatic, and sometimes it's helpful to have a therapist there to support that. Uh, music brings out the social side of people, so 
you can all be in a room like we were today and get everyone just clapping or singing along. And when you're singing with someone beside you, that's a very social and connective feeling. Um, lots of it's really good for expression. You could express yourself maybe playing a drum really loud or banging on the piano more than just saying, like, I'm sad, like just talking about it. But having people in our music groups that the care staff will come and say, I have never seen this person light up like this before. And having them singing, even at full volume, and it's just unbelievable what parts of musical draw out. It really draws a healthy person forward. Boy, let me tell you, it's a great day to be alive. Therapist you can find on mtabc.com and it's uh, the Music Therapy Association of BC and they actually have a find a music therapist option where you can look for music therapists in your area. To support Heartwood's Pay It Forward Community Soup Program, go to heartwoodcc.ca. Well, libraries continue to be an important platform, a media outlet for democracy. Next up, we have a special guest, Renai Morisot. She brings many, many talents, but one of her sharpest tools is storytelling, and she is the resident storyteller at the Downtown Vancouver Public Library. Here's Gunnarji O'Sullivan and Gaiustis in conversation with Ranai Morisot. Hello, I'm Gunnarji O'Sullivan and this is Access Television. Today we have special guest Ranai Morisot who is Soto and Cree. She is a multidisciplinary artist. You've seen her on North of 60 way back when and probably heard her voice on Raven Tales as well as Renegade Press, as, and The uh, Secret at Hidden Lake, and more. She's worked as an actress, producer, she's also written scripts, and she is the new storyteller in residence at the Vancouver Public Library, the seventh storyteller in residence, and she's here to celebrate with us today at Access Television. Plus, we have Gaiustis, and Gaiustis is Squamish, Kwakwakiwak and Nuchalneth. Just don't say Nutka. <laughs> okay, so Renai, you're Soto and you're Cree. Yeah. What a beautiful blend. Yeah, it is. Well, we've mm. talked about you working as an actress, but you also are mm. uh, extremely interested in moving forward as a director and a producer. You recently uh, directed a theatrical production at the Fire Hall Theatre and yeah. it went on tour. Yeah, that was uh, called uh, uh, God and the Indian. And I think um, in terms of getting out of the acting world and, and moving more behind the camera and, and behind uh, the, the makings of theatre is the idea that um, I think that there's a lot of Aboriginal writers and producers and directors that are, are writing our own stories. And a lot of times our stories are about the, 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 the realities of, of this lived experience in Canada and finding our voice in a multitude of ways in response to, in, in pushing against uh, and for our cultural uh, world view in um, putting that on stage or in film. So that's sort of my ideas of uh, wanting to be the storyteller in residence um, at the Vancouver Public Library. Yes, I am the seventh um, storyteller in residence. And I guess the idea is that I'm wanting to dialogue with, with Canadians about what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is, is doing and has done in response to thousands of people that have taken the government to court um, uh, uh, about residential schools. And I think one of the things that I find that people don't realize is that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was in response to the fact that our court systems were with a lot of residential school survivors that were taking. It wasn't something that they said they wanted to do. You know, yeah. so part of my dialogue with people is to try to see what do we mean when we're talking about the 94 recommendations and, and if they're calls to action, where are we going with that? And I think that there's, there's people that are dividing the conversation between those within that impact of residential school mm -hmm. and then they're saying, well, decolonization has to happen 
before reconciliation. And so then we talk about the treaties, like I'm Treaty 1 from Manitoba, and there's numbered treaties across Canada. So it's an interesting dialogue that's happening that I have the honour of, um, of dialoguing with, with people that go to the Vancouver Public Library. Well, the Truth and Reconciliations Commission's work ended in uh, December 15th, mm -hmm. 2015, and I feel like now it's our responsibility as community organizations and other institutions mm -hmm. to step up to those responsibilities and those recommendations that you're talking about. So yeah. I see this Vancouver Public Library initiative as a way of educating people at a community level and otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I totally feel that. And I know um, one of uh, uh, my dear friends that you know and that you do with uh, Co-op Radio, uh, Woody Morrison, always yeah. says, is that, you know, when we walk forward in, in our lives, it's, it's our, our past that is in front of us mm -hmm. in order to inform the types of choices that we make. And so yeah. those words really ring true when it comes to the kind of conversations that are happening um, uh, with these community um, uh, sessions that I'm doing at the Vancouver Public Library. Well, we're all dying to heal. We're all mm -hmm. hungry for our language and culture. What better way to fulfill that hunger through mm -hmm. the entertainment industry? I mean, you've mm -hmm. tapped into a, a nationwide mm -hmm. variety of First Nations artists. Like, uh, what can we expect to see at the Vancouver Public Library? All of the, yeah, thank you. There, the, the, the thing that I'm, I'm wanting to sort of, uh, to, to expose and to, and to share with the people that, that, that utilize our, our uh, Vancouver Public Libraries is the fact that there is a certain pulse that is happening in Aboriginal uh, consciousness and Aboriginal usage of social media and, um, and, and what we're doing on stages and what songs we're writing and how even some of our, our cultural traditions are being invited into places that have never been invited before. And I think because of all of those things that are happening and, and the work that I'm doing with, with looking and, and understanding reconciliation for myself, is that each each of these elements of, of theater, film, um, music uh, are are kind of creating a a, a narrative of of what is specific in moving forward, mm -hmm. you know, for specific groups, for organizations, and for individual artists. And I think that the where we're at right now is uh, to give you an example, I get to interview uh, Ryan McMahon, oh, yeah. who is um, talking about uh, that statement I said earlier, that decolonization has to happen before reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so I want to have that dialogue with him. Yeah. I want to understand what that means, because he's from the treaty territories. We're here on Coast Salish territory, mm -hmm. and, and, which is unceded territory. That means that there was no treaties here. And so there's a whole different mindset and a whole different worldview that when we look at Turtle Island, which is what we call Canada, um, that the, the voice of, of community is kind of coming forward in that pulse of music and that pulse of uh, uh, um, podcast that uh, Ryan McMahon is doing. Um, is giving us a, a, a narrative that I think that we're all kind of moving and, and working in our own ways uh, to do. And he has a comedic background too, so this is perfect <laughs> for, you know, yeah. Indian humor. There's yeah. nothing else like it, especially yeah. when it's coming from a professional comedian. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then you also, yeah. I've heard you say that you're inviting Lorelai Williams of Butterflies and yes. Spirit. Yes. And yes. also uh, Doreen Manuel, who's yeah. a filmmaker. So That's you're right. coming at it from all angles. You're yeah. addressing, you know, uh, yeah. the decolonization, uh, the missing and murdered women, probably homelessness. Yeah. You know, are you really going to look at those 94 re recommendations <laughs> yeah. and then fit that criteria when you, you're thinking about your guests? Well, I think the, the, the thing for me is that... Um, we know in our communities, uh, you know, across Canada, especially here in Vancouver, is that we know in our communities what our needs and our responsibilities are. And, and, in, in, and whether it's in organizations or with the three host nations, that there is certain things that need to happen and that we know that we're working towards doing that. 
what's happening with the murdered and missing women, Lorelai Williams, right from the beginning, has, has been there, and she realized that utilizing art uh, for the Butterflies and Spirit, which is a dance troupe, was an opportunity to bring more Canadians into understanding what that meant for us. Yeah. And also it created this healing mm -hmm. uh, activity for those group of women because all of those women are families of the missing and murdered women. Yeah. So we're going to wrap this up and uh, tell us where to go, <laughs> how long we have to get there. and. Uh, yeah. All well, the our, the closing event at the Vancouver Public Library is on June 20th. I'm bringing 17 Aboriginal published writers together. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you can all come there. The Aboriginal Writers Collective is a part of it. So thank you for Beautiful. inviting me. I can't <laughs> wait to go. And you know, something else that's happening in the community, if you're looking for a traditional or uh, an event that talks about decolonization, we have unceded territories at the Museum of Anthropology, which begins on May 10th and will go until October 16th. You'll have a chance to meet the artist himself, Lawrence Paul. And Guy Eustace, yes. <laughs> you are going on a Peace and Dignity journey. Um, well, the Peace and Dignity journeys is an ongoing uh, intercontinental run where they run from Alaska and then they ran to Teotihuacan, Mexico, and then they ran to Panama. And now the Peace and Dignity Journeys has started again. It happens every four years where they run from Argentina with Condor staffs and they run with Eagle staffs and they run and they meet in the middle for ceremonies. And um, so it started, la um, started now and I believe that the, they should be here sometime around June 12th sometime around that area that they'll be running through here. And there's efforts being pulled together to pull together the canoe families, to pull together the ceremonial people from here, to be able to show our uh, support for unity, peace and dignity. And it's the prophecy of the condor and the eagle coming together where the indigenous people's voice is going to be heard by the world and that the world's going to be ready to hear the voice of the indigenous people. So it's an exciting time having everybody pull together in unity and hopefully they can come and see you too at the library. Some of the people will be here. I know that they're really busy. They do ceremonies all the time. I also wanted to make mention of what happened too in New York on Earth Day uh -huh. that the indigenous people of North Central and South America were united together to sign a treaty for um, the indigenous people of the world to save Mother Earth on behalf of Mother Earth. So lots of really exciting things happening out there. Uh, now I'm going to leave you with uh, footage from the INAC occupation that happened in Vancouver. As you know, it's been a, they held a nationwide occupation from Toronto to Regina right here in Vancouver. Here it is. Over 30 years ago, Hanson Lau helped ignite a campaign to redress 62 years of racist Chinese head tax and exclusionary legislation using the power of radio on AM 1470 CJVB on Chinese overseas broadcast. Hello and welcome to Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. My name is Sid Tan and I'm here with Hanson Lau, who can say, help galvanize the Chinese head tax and exclusion redress movement. Welcome to the show, Hanson. You're welcome. It's so great to have you here. We've worked together for many years and now we get to talk on 
the eve of the 10th anniversary of Stephen Harper's unilaterally imposed settlement on June 22nd, 2006. I'd just like to start with you because you were there at the beginning. Can you just give us a brief rundown of what happened and how this got going? Okay, the uh, head tax movement started when Margaret Mitchell, who was the MP for Vancouver East, was approached by two members of the Chinese community who paid the head tax, okay? And one of them was Charlie uh, Mack. The other was Buddy Young. Yes, the two of them. So uh, they approached Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell, representing them, went to uh, the parliament and brought this issue up in the parliament. And Vancouver Sun reported it. And uh, I do my radio program every day, reading the Vancouver Sun and uh, interpreting it in Chinese, Cantonese, to the audience to give a background. So when I read the uh, news about the head tax, it was a surprise to me. I came into Canada in 1966. I didn't know anything about the head tax. So I invited Margaret Mitchell to the radio show to explain it to uh, the audience. Many of them are from Hong Kong and they do not know the background. So the head tax going back a long time, it was a, uh, a uh, how you call that, a racist uh, uh, legislation. Yeah, In actual fact, fact yeah. the intent is to stop immigration of Chinese into Canada. Started with $5 and then uh, 25 Started with $50 oh, in 1885, okay. went up to $100 in 1904, went up to uh, $500, and then $500 in 1905, I believe. And then in 1923, no amount of money, Chinese exclusion from 1923 to 1947. 62 years of legislated racism against the Chinese. Now, $500 at that time can buy you two houses, all right? Anyway, so I interviewed Margaret Mitchell, and uh, during, the, during the interview, it occurred to me that beside these two Clement, there may be more people outside who uh, paid the head tax, okay? So during the program, I announced, I said, if you pay the head tax and you still have the certificate, come to the radio program, uh, uh, office and we will register you and then give this certificate to Margaret Mitchell. So more people, maybe more power. So on the first weekend, 400 people showed up at my office. Wow. And uh, I, have to, I have to do it again the second weekend. Another 400 people showed up. Wow. We have to do it the third time. So eventually, 1,200 people showed up at my office to register with the actual certificate. So I turned over the registration to Margaret Mitchell and uh, to the CNCC, and we started the movement to uh, ask the federal government for the head tax redress. Yeah. The head tax redress is one thing, and we always concentrate on the head tax redress. There's also the exclusion, 1923 to 27, which most of the children of head taxpayers suffered. And I'd like to really actually make it clear right now, it was 62 years, and part of the redress was not just about the head tax, because that was the money issue. The exclusion part was the family separating, and really, in many ways, more insidious than actually the head tax. And now, it, that it, was in 1982, 83. Okay, let me make a comment. Oh, you're, when you, I, and, and when the other I thing. When brought it up in the, yeah. in the radio. Yeah, it, people should know too, that in 1983, 82, at that time, there weren't a lot of Chinese media, Chinese language media in town. The overseas Chinese voice, Wa Ji Singh, was a program my grandmother used to listen to, and I just <laughs> want to tell you that. Well. Our, we, we pride ourselves in speaking for the Chinese, okay? The, that's why it's called the Overseas Chinese Voice. And uh, the comment I want to make is that if the government at the time were to address this, because Charlie Mack only won $500 back, okay? Symbolic. Yeah, he paid 500 He said, give me back 500 I'm happy, all right? Now, the government at the time and subsequent uh, government keep on saying no. As a result, this long drawn out uh, uh, time, 
involve a lot of second generation uh, uh, in, involved in the, in the claim. And the second generation, including people like you and other people, are doctors, the professors, and uh, professional people. They start calculating, they say, look, it's not $500. It's $500 at that time that can buy two houses. Okay, you, you talk about buying two houses now, <laughs> the amount is phenomenal, <laughs> yeah. right? So anyway, they drag out the process, they refuse to, to apologize, they refuse to uh, address the uh, uh, tax uh, redress, they refuse to compensate for the people who suffered, and as a result of that, okay, during the election, when Stephen Harper was uh, 2005 campaign, general 2005, election. came to talk to us, what's the issue in the Chinese community? We said, it's the hat tax. And he campaigned on making a formal apology and making compensation. He didn't say how the compensation was to be done, all right? But after the election, true to his word, I've got to give him credit. So do I. All right? He did formally apologize in the parliament. And he did compensate the living at that time. The, the people who paid the head tax but still living, plus the widows. Yes. All right? But that only 700 to 800 Yes. Less than a thousand compensation, all right? Which to me is less than symbolic. It's, it's not even fair, all right? And nothing was done to compensate the second generation. Just to let you know, I'm third generation. I'm the grandson of a head taxpayer. But what I want to know, Hanson, is that you mentioned you got here in 1966. You have very little to do with the head tax and all that. Well, what gets you so fired up about this? What me, gets you so going on let this? Me, let me explain, okay? My involvement in the head tax movement is not on the basis of me being a Chinese person, all right? I figured that one out for a long time. At the beginning, I was doing the Chinese radio show, speaking for the Chinese community, speaking for the head tax payers. But I realize as I go along that I am involved in the head tax movement, head tax redress movement, because I'm Canadian. This is a Canadian value, doing something which is right, all right? My father or my grandfather, they did not pay the head tax. I have no vested interest in the head tax. And the second generation uh, redress, nothing to do with me, except I think this is the right thing to do. As a Canadian, all right? Justice delayed is justice denied. And the whole head tax movement sh should be based on one certificate, one claim. We're gonna have to get going pretty soon, Hanson. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to get to you. How do you think we should move forward on this? I think you should continue to fight. And uh, that, again, is another Canadian value. They never give up until the right thing is done. Okay. And I just want to make clear, is there anything else that you want to add before we have to leave? Uh, I don't want to add, add anything. I want to say that, Sid, you are involved in the head tax movement. I want you to continue to fight. I will continue to fight with you. I understand you guys are going to have uh, another annual general meeting, so maybe you should tell the audience uh, what it is, and uh, if they want to help, come and help you. Well, I guess the, uh, thank you for everything, Hanson, and uh, it's, it's so good to have you here. I should let people know that we are continuing to organize. This has been, for me personally, an over 30-year struggle. And uh, I, I'm glad to see it. And uh, thank you for coming on the show, Hanson. You're welcome. Uh, it's so good to have you here. And uh, full disclosure, uh, I am uh, a founder and uh, former past president of the Head Tax Family Society of Canada. I'm currently vice president of the Head Tax Family Society of Canada. And if you want any more information on our efforts, uh, you can email info 
at headtaxfamilies.ca. That's info at headtaxfamilies.ca. And until we get a full, just, and honorable settlement that will include the elderly affected sons and daughters of head taxpayers who suffered the exclusion. And remember, exclusion was more insidious. In many ways, the head tax today might be considered a tax grab, but it was very racist tax grab and exclusion. And the 62 years of racist legislation needs to be closed. So my name is Sid Tan. You're watching Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Until we meet again, straight shooting and tight edits. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Well, artists continue to be at the vanguard of social change, and this year's Queer Arts Festival is going to be a good one. They've moved from Pride season in August to June to coincide with their theme, Stonewall. It was a riot. It happened in 1969, and we can see the visual curation of that at the Roundhouse this June. Here's MTS Popat speaking with Rachel Iwaasa. Hi, this is MTS Puppet, and uh, I'm here with Rachel Iwaasa from the Queer Arts Festival, which is actually moving this year from the traditional time uh, around after Pride to around the time of the Stonewall Riots, which is the historical time. So Rachel, what is the reason for moving the festival to the end of June uh, to coincide with the Stonewall? Well, we have quite a number of reasons. Um, when we first started out, the idea was that the festival would function kind of as a bridge between Pride Season and the Queer Film Festival. Mm -hmm. That there wasn't a lot happening in terms of arts and culture in that time. If we mm. wanted to celebrate Pride, you know, of course there was the parade, there were bars and parties, but there were, um, there were fewer cultural offerings. And in that time since, um, since I mean, we started up in 1998 as a visual as an arts exhibition, um, now it's actually become quite a crowded field. I mean, we like to think that's in part due to our influence. There's now actually a lot of arts and culture events that are surrounding Pride, so the field is getting a little bit crowded. So you started more of, a, more of as an ex exhibition type thing. Yeah. Is now you've got more performance, a lot of variety in there, and. It's been doing a lot, and it's at the Roundhouse, right? It's yes. still, still at the Roundhouse. We're based at the Roundhouse every year. Right. So what are the days this year? We're from June 21st to June 30th. Okay. So moving, we chose the end of June because, as you say, it is the time of the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. That's, it was the Stonewall Riots that really sparked the movement of Pride Parades worldwide, mm. and that means that we're able to be at uh, the time that the rest of the world celebrates Pride. Right, and then it goes into the whole Pride season. Yeah. So what are the highlights for this year's festival, Rachel? Well, we are incredibly excited to be welcoming Jonathan D. Katz to be curating the visual arts exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, the theme of the festival as a whole is Stonewall was a riot. Okay. The idea being that we are celebrating the tradition of the arts as Arts has been, well, really from Oscar Wilde to general idea, artists have been at the vanguard of the civil rights, the queer civil rights struggle, mm -hmm. and with, uh, with social and aesthetic innovations inextricably entwined. Mm -hmm. um, so the show, all the shows in the festival are focusing on artists as activists and on the arts as one of the ways that we change hearts and change minds. So Jonathan Katz's exhibition is called Drama Queer, Seducing Social Change. Yeah, and you were talking about a composer that's coming in uh, who, who's, uh, who was an uh, act up activist. Tell us about that. Yeah, so similar to Jonathan D. Katz, who was, uh, he was one of the founders of Queer Nation in mm -hmm. the United States, mm -hmm. we're also bringing in Lyle Chen, who's a composer from Australia, who was one of the driving forces between, uh, driving forces of ACT UP in Australia. Mm -hmm. He quit composition for a number of years to work full-time as an AIDS activist, but continued to sketch. And um, the product of these sketches now, 20 years later, um, he's created a string quartet, an AIDS activist's memoir. So he will be narrating. And um, there's an Australian quartet, the Acacia Quartet, who's coming to perform the work. Right. What else is uh, exciting this year's festival? Um, 
We're also going to be bringing a show called Dragging PF. Mm -hmm. um, tenor Tr Frederick Robert, who's got an absolutely amazing voice and does PF in drag, is doing a show around uh, it's the premises of a uh, uh, drag artist who does who, for, who has a PF persona, um, and um, PF kind of becomes he becomes a product of the streets, much like PF herself. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a show that touches on uh, mental health issues, drug addiction, um, being, you know, street involvement. So there's a lot held together by Frederick's magnificent voice. Mm -hmm. um, we're also collaborating with Frank Theater on a show called The Pink Line. Mm -hmm. um, they have gathered um, people from the community to talk about racism in the queer communities here in Vancouver and working with Jonathan Sinan who's from um, Buddies in Bad Times in Toronto and yes. Lemon Tree in Toronto um, whose specialty is on taking dialogue everyday the statements of everyday people and crafting them into a workable the piece of theatre. Yeah, well, it's great, amazing, because you're, you're balancing art with activism and, and connecting global queer issues to local issues, yeah. working with local artists and so on, and dealing with issues around racism and other things, too. It sounds really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's, I want to emphasize again, really, that Katz is one of the, is, uh, as someone who's been uh, he, an activist and an art historian. I mean, he's best known for having curated the first ever LGBT-themed uh, exhibition at a major American museum, mm -hmm. and that was Hide Seek at the Smithsonian. So he's coming from the Smithsonian to be curating for us here at the Roundhouse, um, which we are tremendously excited about. He's giving access to um, to a caliber of artists that we won't have seen at the festival before, um, including three never-before-exhibited monumental paintings by Attila Richard Lukács. Wow. Sounds really exciting, Rachel. Um, I'm really excited to, to be there. Thank you for being here with here with us on Access TV. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So this is MTS Papa with uh, Rachel Ibaasa from the Queer Arts Festival for Access Television. Next up is Hot Topics, and the Hot Topic is, if you're on disability, you used to be able to buy a bus pass for the year for $45. Things aren't so simple anymore. Here's Kelly with some of those details. Hi, this is MTS Papa with Hot Topics here on Access TV, and joining me is Kelly Rayburn, who's a regular contributor here on Access TV, and also hosts uh, the, uh, the Community Living Show. On Co-op radio, Co radio on, on CITR, UBC. Mostly on the NCR radio networks. There you go. And you were recently at a rally in Victoria about the cuts to the accessible bus passes. Mm -hmm. So tell us, when was that and what happened? So it happened on Wednesday, uh, April 13th. About close to about a hundred people, mostly from in from the Independent Housing Society in Victoria, gathered around and saying the demand, saying no, we don't want these bus uh, bus pass to add an additional fifty two dollars per month on the additional forty five dollars on on the flat rate of the bus pass. Yeah, so just bring up to speed to our, our viewers here as to what happened annually. Uh, people with accessibility get an annual bus pass. So this is a, a change, right? Well, this is a change for all disabilities and uh, for seniors mm -hmm. over 65 with lower incomes. Mm -hmm. The disability and lower income rates deal with a lot of, well, I should say more like more income assistance where mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have enough money, uh, pro probably doing their accessibility on, on jobs or any other issues that, that come in, into the, the process. Yeah. And as a regular bus um, person, as for myself, I, I do have a uh, don't I mean I do get lower income assistance uh, from others, but that's when the, the provincial government comes in and deals with the rent, deals with everything on on issues on disability. Yeah. So so uh, people with disabilities have got an increase in the amount they get. But now they have to pay fifty-two dollars every month mm -hmm. uh, for a bus for the pass. bus pass. So it's going to affect them in a bad way, isn't it? It is going to affect on some of the people with disabilities. For either one, they don't have 
have difficulties of getting a job, mm -hmm. or the income assistance may affect on their rents, their uh, the grocery shoppings, or any other types of other incomes mm -hmm. that come in, into the process of income assistance. Right. So the rally happened and... Rally the, happened on, yes. Yeah, so the rally happened on May, the, the, April 13th yeah. at noon at the legislature. And everybody, like I said, around 100 people were, close to about 100 people gathered around to talk about the discussion. So it will be also on, on the clip as um, I, I go along through, through this conference. Right. Uh, and now I guess the, is to put pressure on the government. There's an election mm -hmm. next spring. Well, the, the election will start somewhere around April or May around yeah. there. But the bus pass situation will start take effect after September, October, right. when they renew their registry of their bus yeah. pass. So that's when it really take effect and people will be affected on it directly. That's correct. Is there uh, some place people can go for more information or, or, or get involved or or send letters or protests to? Just uh, send, uh, send letters to the Liberal uh, candidate in your region if the Liberal uh, MLAs are saying they agree on Christy Clark on adding in the 45, let, uh, not 45, $54 per month, just to say, no, we don't want the, we don't want the $54 per month. We just, we rather have the $45 per year instead of the $54 per month in addition to the, to the bus pass. Right. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for joining us on Hot Topics today. So this is MTS Puppet and Kelly Rayburn on Hot Topics for this uh, program. I have here a special literary edition of the Megaphone with our friend Hendrik Boon on the cover. This is yours for $5. Actually, the May issue of Megaphone features an interview with Jim Pattison, the CEO of Expo 86, 30 years ago. The Expo 86 sparked the closure of 700 SROs, some deaths, and some debt, and it actually fueled the affordability crisis we're experiencing now in Vancouver. Give it a read. I'm Molly Caron, and I'm grateful to be here with this wonderful group of volunteers bringing you the stories of our community. If you have a story, please bring it to us. We can handle the truth. Until we meet again, keep it real. Thank you. Pack your bags, leave your troubles at home.